Well, I'm known as Bessie. Anyway, Bessie Webb. Glen Ray is known as a timber village rather than... Gold was discovered first in 1880, 1881, but it's gold cut out at the turn of the century and um, it's more known as a timber village. Timber took over then. The um, railways and roads uh, was spreading out all over New South Wales at the turn of the century and there was a big demand for timber and timber was plentiful around here. So some of the prospectors that took up land uh, in around the 1905 mark uh, got into timber and there was bullock teams and um, for sleepers and the railway. They were agitating for a railway to open up the country well, how it got out in the first place, the coastal steamers were coming up uh, to Grafton. They also were coming into Coffs, but Coffs was known as a very bad port in those days. People had to be loaded off in baskets off the, off the steamers in, in, onto the ferries, and one of my relations remembers being loaded off in the basket. But it mainly came into South Grafton. The, the wharves were at South Grafton and the bullock teams took the logs into there, yeah, and the sleepers and things. But later on, the railway to Glen Ray started from South Grafton in 1913, and it got out as far as Kangala. Uh, there was great agitation there because there was traffic jams with bullock teams in the loading yard to load the... They offloaded the timber trucks to take it then by trucks and they were pleading for the for the railway people to send more trucks to save them going that extra time into Glen Ray because I think it used to take a week for the bullock wagons to get from Glen Ray to, to Grafton and back. My father was a, was a bullock driver and a timber cutter as well and us as kids had timber cutters living all around us, timber workers, strong, uh, capable men. I used to think they cared a lot about us kids, but uh, I think um, because mum cooked their corned meat and we hand milked about five or six cows and mum made homemade butter, you've got to think that we were 11 mile up Talawanja Creek <laughs> away from the store, so the men were appreciative of milk and homemade butter. And my earliest memories is going to, the, to their tents and camps with food for them from mum. <laughs> and then them minding us while mum and dad went to Grafton. If you went to Grafton in the sulky in those days, you stayed overnight. The railway came to Glen Ray in 1915, and that's when they started loading. They put a gantry in over there to load the timber, and they loaded the timber, then went from Glen Ray. And they used to have get their sleepers and put them in the, in the yards, as they called them over there, and, and the inspector had passed them and then they'd be loaded on to the trucks and things, the timber trucks, and they'd go from there. And then when the train went on to Dorigo, the Dorigo line was opened in 1924, the timber trucks came down from, from the Dorigo, loaded with timber from up there. Um, and very few, just one passenger carriage and a lot of timber came down. When the timber workers went up in there, they didn't own the land, or my father owned the land, and I know my uncles owned the land, but they'd let cutters on. And you cut for so much, you had to pay royalty on the timber that you cut. You cut them and you barked them, you took the bark off. To cut the sleepers, they had a broad axe. As a kid, Dad would say to us, who's going to blue tongue for us today? And blue tongue was the, that you came behind the, the wagon and put the brake on when the bullocks were going downhill. So there was always somebody to release the brake when they got down or put it on a bit more if the, if, if the wagon was gaining on the bullocks going down a, a, a steep hill or something like that. The two back bullocks were called polars. Um, because they had the pole in between them uh, fastened to their neck and uh, they, they were called the polers and the leaders. You had special, special bullocks for special jobs they were trained for uh, because I remember if you lost a leader you, were, you looked around for another leader bullock from somebody else that had a leader. That, uh, and it was marvellous how those bullocks um, knew their position in the team. I can remember my dad yoking them up and uh, we'd help him put the pin in as kids on the yoke that kept the heavy yoke round the bullock's neck and connected them. Uh, we'd be there 
helping him and whatever, and they'd just go and stand. We weren't frightened of them or anything. Um, our property was a long, long lane up to it, and we were right near the house was slip rails across the lane, and we kids used to go out and let the slip rails down for the different the different um, bullockies as they were passing through with their loads or uh, things. Bullocky was the term we called the driver of the, he was a bullocky, yeah. And uh, Dad, had, when he, Dad came home that night, he'd say, who was on the, who did you let the slip rails down for today? Sometimes we'd say the leader's name, like whatever the, we knew every leader's name, like Dodger and Smart and Dodger was one, and we didn't say smart too well sometimes. <laughs> and and they, he used to laugh, I remember. You know, smart, we let smart and Dodger through rather than the owner's name. But we all, all called the men by their first name. Um, but we, we, I don't remember that we were disrespectful to them. It was just the way the kids were, you know, in, the, in, in those days. My father didn't go to school a day in his life. Uh, he was born at the head of the Clarence River, uh, up at um, in the Malera gold fields, and there was no schools up there. But his mother could read and write, and she taught him. Him, but um, all the old timber workers told me he had the greatest um, uh, mind for working out the super feet in a in a log, timber tree growing. They get him to ha say how many sleepers, he could tell you how many sleepers they'd cut out a log just by looking at it or walking around it. And Big girders went out of here. They were the girders under the bridge, under the wooden bridges, the big heavy ones. In trying to work out it, whether any of the logs fl floated down, they used the, I think they did, but they had to do it in the Arara. They had to wait till the rise was in the river to float the logs down, but I can't, couldn't see, because of the narrowness of it, I couldn't see where they'd put big loads of it across. You know, they'd only be small lots, I think. In 1936, my grandmother died and we went over to work her farm. By then he'd finished, he'd got rid of his bullet team, we'd started dairying. He swapped his bullocks because he was getting too old to walk the distance on the road. He was in his in his mid fifties at that stage, and got some cows for us. He thought he had uh, kids to milk cows. He could <laughs> start dairy. I remember him building the dairy and swapping his bullocks for the from, to Mr Green for some cows, and we started dairying and set and. Um, separating for cream. In those days the factory was at Cranber and we brought the cream down in the sulky with, to meet the cream lorry uh, because he wouldn't go all the way up there on the rough roads and we'd have to bring it down and meet him halfway up Tallawadja Creek near the school and he'd take the cream and uh, he'd bring you the ready-made butter then, you'd buy the butter back. Um, but we still had the separator and we could separate, fed calves, fed pigs, um, but I am into history. I love the history of, um, of the village. Mm, Glenway, yeah.